Good morning, everyone. Uh, we're going to go ahead and get started today uh, on this panel. So if you're coming in right now, make your way to a seat. Um, we're going to go ahead and get started. Great. Um, so uh, today we are going to be talking about restoration and wetland mitigation uh, and the challenges of jurisdiction, location, and historic contamination. Uh, so we've got a great panel with us today. Uh, we'll go through introductions here in a second, then we've got a little bit of background. Uh, then we've got some prepared questions to go through, and then we're going to reserve 10 to 12 minutes uh, for open question Q&A at the end of the session. Um, so thanks so much for coming and spending the time with us. I know there's a, a lot of great panels today to talk about. Um, but yeah, so we're going to go ahead and get it started. Uh, my name is Brian Crane. Uh, I'm with Matrix New World Engineering. Uh, before that, I was at Jacobs, and before that, I was with the New York City Economic Development Corporation, uh, managing the city's waterfront inspection and rehabilitation program across all five boroughs. I was there for 13 years, something like that. Um, so intimately familiar with the waterfront and happy to be supporting uh, this Waterfront Alliance event and this panel here today. Um, with that, I'll hand it over to Heather for introduction. Oh, great, thank you. Um, my name is Heather Gearloff. I work for the DEC. I'm the Hudson River Programs um, Program Specialist, uh, Supervisor, and Estuary Coordinator. So my role at the department is to oversee the management of four Hudson-focused programs. You may be familiar with some of them, the Hudson River Estuary Program, the Hudson River National Estuary Research Reserve. Our fisheries team went to all the great fish monitoring on the Hudson, and our river habitats team that do the um, regulatory um, enforcement on uh, project proposals on the Hudson. So um, one of the things that we wanted to touch on as we enter into this panel was um, why is restoration of wetlands mitigation so important in today's time and in the future? And um, in my opinion, I think that as we move forward, we can expect more intense storm events. We know that we have rising sea levels, What's really important is intertidal marshes do protect our shorelines from erosion. They absorb floodwaters. They help protect our infrastructure. Um, and if we don't address that in the future, what we're gonna find is they are submerged and potentially not functioning optimally. So that's why I think it's so important. Great, thanks Heather. Yep. Rob? Right. Hi everybody, uh, Rob Perani. I work for the Hudson River Foundation and my primary role is I'm the director of the New York, New Jersey Harbor and Estuary Program. Uh, HAP is a collaboration of government, scientists, community organizations, uh, and utility partners. And uh, we work together on uh, shared priorities trying to advance uh, clean water, habitat, public access, and community engagement uh, across the estuary. I'm really uh, thrilled I have our, the two co-chairs of our restoration work group. I'm sitting next to um, Terry Doss, uh, and I see Rebecca Swadek from New York City Parks. Uh, in the back, and so we work with par great partners like that to advance uh, estuary restoration, and I will stand further away from this slide. <laughs> um, I'm gonna talk in a minute and give uh, people a little uh, primer on, uh, on um, you know, our restoration goals, the comprehensive restoration plan, so I'll, I'll reserve my comments on, on why it's important for that. Great, thanks, Rob. And good morning, I'm Terry Doss. I'm the director for the Meadowlands Research and Restoration Institute which is the scientific arm for the New Jersey Sports and Exposition Authority. Um, and basically, we protect the delicate balance of nature within the Meadowlands that's surrounded by this urban life. And like Rob, I'm gonna skip the three important reasons and wrap it into my answer to one of your questions and pass it on to Max. Sure. Good morning, uh, my name is Max Taffet, Senior Vice President of Offshore Wind and Port NYC Planning. Uh, for the New York City Economic Development Corporation. Uh, for those who haven't heard of uh, NYC EDC, uh, where Brian was with us for, for many years, um, I, I've been at the organization for a decade. In its most recent iteration, EDC has been around for about 30 years uh, and holds an annual maritime contract on behalf of the city of New York. So with that, we find ourselves responsible for the broad portfolio that was formerly the Department of Ports and Trade, uh, and that is uh, you know, 300 or so miles uh, of the 520 mile uh, waterfront of New York City. Uh, and when it comes to that, this is an important topic because whether or not 
it's piles under an esplanade, the kind of supporting structure, or piles under a cruise terminal or wharf at an offshore wind port, or whether it's something that used to be a port facility and is now a soft shoreline, uh, there's a real strong sort of give and take with keeping uh, our shorelines intact and functional for green uses or for uh, gray uses. Great. Thanks, everybody. Um, so we're going to uh, hand it over to Rob uh, to give us a little bit of background um, on the restoration uh, projects that we have and, and some of the definitions around them. Great. Well, thank, thanks. Uh, so, um, you know, as I mentioned, uh, uh, about, I want to say, 20 years ago, uh, the Hudson River Foundation, together with our partners at the Army Corps of Engineers and um, uh, the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey, embarked on creating a comprehensive restoration plan for the Hudson River estuary. And uh, Jim Lodge from the foundation is here who worked on that document if you have any real questions. But um, the way that the group went about defining what restoration meant and, and kind of going to what Heather was talking about in terms of the importance of wetlands and shorelines was identifying not that we were going to come back, go back to some pre-Columbian, you know, state of nature, uh, but more that we, what were the, what were the ecological characteristics, uh, the target ecosystem characteristics that we were trying to achieve in thinking about uh, restoring uh, the estuary and, you know, recognizing the loss of about 85 percent of the tidal wetlands that once were here uh, at the confluence of the Hudson and Raritan rivers. Um, and so we identified 12, and you know, the, the conversation today is really around sort of that set of shoreline features uh, from sort of the, the, um, uh, uh, on the, the tidal, the subtitle habitat, uh, oyster reefs, uh, where you find crabs, and, and once you found lobsters, uh, to um, uh, those sort of intertidal areas, uh, wetlands that uh, rely on sort of daily tidal inundation all the way up to the shoreline in the places that only get inundated on occasion. And you know, those are, that kind of cross-section of our, of our estuary is really a super highly productive area. Um, it's really where sort of the magic happens, where the daily uh, fluctuations of tide um, sort of drive nutrients in and out and uh, make it one of the most highly productive uh, places on the planet. Um, and so, but of course it's also as, as Max and Brian and others in the room well know, it's also where uh, we, the human uses uh, are critical. You know, it's what we rely on, so to ha have a working port, uh, it's where we uh, need to manage that dynamic dynamism uh, to prevent erosion and to protect people and property. Um, and it's also where, you know, if you think about waterfront access and, and all the other public goods that are out there, that's where you need to have some structures uh, to preserve those shorelines in a lot of ways and accommodate the you know 14 million plus or minus people that live in the region so um it's really in that zone that our, our conversation today and how we balance those uses uh and of course you know we are, are you know people like terry and others in this room are expert at restoring those functions and whether it's big projects like the marsh islands in jamaica bay or smaller projects uh, we've learned a lot in the last you know 30 or plus years about uh, both conserving nature, but also restoring those ecological functions. Um, but the reality is that um, it's still a challenge, right? Um, despite our best efforts, despite a lot of money being put in, and, and regulations uh, and permitting uh, that sort of are, are intended to protect wetlands, uh, we're not really gaining ground. And again, kind of going back and, and sort of moving the needle on that 85% that was lost. Um, in the last 10 years, our, our upcoming State of the Estuary report that we produced with um, the Hudson River Estuary Program, uh, you know, has found that we've lost about 1% of those wetlands in both New York and New Jersey. And, you know, some of that is from permitting. Um, some of that is from, you know, permitted development, I should say. Um, you know, some of that is from erosion and storms. And, um, and we'll talk about more about that in a minute. And then some of that is you know, the restoration efforts that, you know, are, have not been successful. Um, and so even though we thought we were mitigating loss elsewhere, we didn't achieve the goals we had intended to do. Um, so I just wanted to sort of set that out as a little bit of a, a stage setting uh, for the more detailed conversation to follow. I'm gonna pass it over to Terry. Yeah, so thanks, oh. Rob. No, that's okay. Um, so uh, Terry, I think 
we've got a question about legacy contamination. So um, the question for you to, to uh, go through, what role is legacy contamination playing and what strategies can be implemented when suitable locations for restorations uh, are scarce? And I'll answer that. <laughs> There we go. In just a second. First, I'll tell you where the Meadowlands is in case you're not familiar. Uh, it's about five miles just west of here, and it really is a green oasis of about 5,000 acres of tidal wetlands, completely surrounded by urban life. And it, it's really defined by the infrastructure that uh, borders it and bisects it. We have highways, rail lines, uh, pipelines that, that run in and around the, the Meadowlands. And um, these systems need constant maintenance and, and improvements. Um, and in addition to that, there's, there's always uh, development pressures, even uh, in this day and age. And there's ongoing remediation of these systems due to legacy contaminants. The Hackensack River is a Superfund site, as are a number of the tributaries uh, within the district. So we, we have a lot going on in, in the background. Um, and we, we, look, we look to uh, needing mitigation as well as restoration due to all of these past influences. I'm going to go back to this slide first. Um, so th all these pressures impact our, our natural habitats. And we also have, as, as everyone's mentioned, changing climate, rising sea levels and a history of anthropogenic impacts on these wetlands. So there's this constant urgent need for mitigation and restoration. But these efforts to, to undertake these projects are hampered often due to this historic legacy of contamination. Um, there's basically what it is, there's a fear that these sites will be recontaminated after the rehabilitation actions occur, which might then pose a risk to wildlife. But there, I, I believe there's also a risk to our wildlife if we don't restore these urban habitats. And I also think that by not doing so, we're furthering the environmental injustices that have plagued our urban coastal communities for hundreds of years. So the strategies that we're taking to overcome these uh, hurdles and try to move this 20 to 30 year old discussion forward include working with state and federal agencies to set a clear and consistent path forward that is firmly based in the 20 years of data that show there are minimal to no risk to wildlife after a tidal wetland site is rehabilitated. And Max can uh, go on at length about the costs of those tests, uh, but there's uh, some real recent data that he and his, his uh, consultants have come up with that show that there's minimal to no risk to wildlife. We're also working to change our approach to restoration. We did all the easy projects where you just remove invasives and plant natives, but now we're looking to re-nourish our wetlands, especially in, in light of sea level rise. So there's new techniques that cause less of a risk of reopening legacy contaminants. Uh, we also need to talk about adaptive management and um, how we're incorporating these methods from the start of the project. We talk a lot about it, but we often can't put the, the money into it because we've used it all up in, in studies beforehand. Um, but adaptive management should be built into the project and look at techniques such as construction occurring over multiple years while trying to keep those MOB and DMOB costs down. Uh, but there's, there's techniques to build off of and learn what we do so that we can implement it into the project as we go and also use new technologies to make the monitoring process a lot easier, using drones, using acoustic recording units and remote cameras. So we're, we're keeping the human touch off of the land and letting it rewild itself for a little bit. And I'll move forward to this slide. One of our uh, most important strategies is changing the way that we talk about these places and putting aside historic negative connotations. From the Meadowlands, they were written off long ago, but nature thrived despite our, our intentions and practices. And we do this because the risks of not doing it are too high. This is two drone shots that I put together to show you what's happening right now in the Meadowlands and, and elsewhere. This land was once all tidal wetland, and over time it was degraded and it was deemed too costly due to its contamination to restore, and it's now being filled and converted to warehouses. 
right next to this site, there's nesting bald eagles, nesting osprey. We also have nesting salt marsh sparrows, savanna sparrows, grasshopper sparrows, and um, diamondback terrapin are nesting right next to this area. So over the past 40 years, we've worked hard to mitigate and restore these wetlands, and we really have created habitats for these wildlife. But we need to improve our collaboration so we can continue to restore these sites for all the benefits that everyone discussed that they provide to our coastal communities, human and non-human. Great, thanks, Terry. So uh, for the group, um, beyond Meadowlands, what, um, what kind of lessons learned or strategies can be pulled for future projects? You know, Terry mentioned uh, capping and, and long-term maintenance. Are there other strategies that we've seen uh, that we could pull forward uh, to suggest? I would just add that um, when we have a contaminated site, um, I think it's important that as we think about a contaminated site from the very beginning, um, in the record of decisions, in conversations with partners, with redevelopers, that we really talk about mitigation and we think about restoration as one of those elements, but it has to start in the very beginning. Everybody has to be on board, including the sponsors, the landowners, the redevelopers, that you know it's going to be required that they have to mitigate and offset any kind of um, rest or anything that they do on site, and that, that might include capping, or it might be removed, removed material. Um, for an example, as you go up the river, almost the entire Hudson River along the shoreline in Westchester and Rockland were industrial. And as we get to a remediation site, um, historically it's always just been capped and developed. Um, so we really need to work with our local partners to advocate for the redevelopment to be you know, strategically placed so we can still allow for restoration what we remediate. So can we can we lower an area and not fill it in so it can be intertidal marsh um, and reclaim some of that. And, and that's going to be something that we have to do from the very beginning and we need partners in our municipalities and our landowners and our developers to push that forward. So, so uh, alignment is key. Mm -hmm. um, I think Max you've, you've had challenges around alignment in general and projects myself um, and I think this group here has been a great uh, group of collaborators on projects. Any thoughts on, on ideas around aligning uh, all the different stakeholders and parties uh, to move projects forward? I, I think time always helps. Uh, starting early, engaging. Um, you know, with the projects that we've been working on and, and kind of I, my experience was around setting up the first tidal wetland mitigation bank uh, in New York City. We started that process in 2012, uh, didn't get into construction until 2017, uh, and then construction itself took two years. Um, but really that, that five years of site identification, uh, feasibility analysis, and really a, a, an in-depth stakeholder process with the regulators. Um, an incredibly important component of this and, and kind of going to what, what Heather mentioned, I mean the role of a mitigation bank is to be doing a lot of that hard work up front uh, and, and before you are uh, sort of looking at uh, an active development site where uh, you are, are looking at delays costing, costing time and, and money for everybody uh, and so a mitigation bank is, is kind of doing your homework and, and overcoming uh, and working through all stakeholder sort of questions. I think there's a real opportunity and a need for us to, to increase alignment sort of between our various levels of government, be that locally, be that at the state level and at the federal level. I think often one of the challenges uh, is uh, project proponents for a restoration or for hard infrastructure sort of feel like they are jumping over one hurdle, but then they come to realize that that's only the hurdle for one of those three sort of levels of stakeholder interaction. Uh, and, and then maybe come to answers, and those answers then, there isn't perfect alignment with the other level of government. And so that's what kind of can end up taking five years. Um, and I think it's sort of, you know, particularly in a context like New York City where we are I think, unlike a lot of the other places in the United States, uh, a need for sort of sort of consensus among the different levels of government about what makes for good projects. And I think that's a lot of what Rob's group and, and others on the panel are up to. Would you say and for make what makes for a good project, but also uh, prioritize sites? So 
is there a process right now for prioritizing sites, and are there new technologies that can help us align you know, future restoration sites sooner in the process for, for opportunities down the road? So, the, you know, the Comprehensive Restoration Plan identifies there's more than 300 sites that were identified through the Restoration Work Group and, and the engagement of partners as restoration opportunities. And, you know, it's a, it's a fairly general level of alignment in terms of priority sites. You know, what, but what's often missing is that kind of uh, solvement of good information, uh, whether it's uh, identification of priority areas for conservation, um, or um, uh, identification for uh, uh, identification of um, you know uh, the value of past monitoring efforts. Uh, one of the things that is kind of an issue is that you know typically a, a restoration project or a mitigation project uh, it's funded the monitor is, is funded for a couple of years, uh, but we know that the actual value of a restoration site and those kind of the restoration of those ecological functions can take, you know, decades if not longer. And so being able to monitor sites for longer um, is critical. Um, uh, just uh, uh, last summer, we're doing a project with, with Heather's uh, team uh, that will be really launched next summer, but uh, um, the foundation uh, went out and uh, surveyed some, re some mitigation work that was done off 125th Street in Manhattan, uh, some reef balls that were placed there. Uh, and we found that, in fact, uh, there was a fair amount of oysters that were naturally settling there, uh, something that was super encouraging. Uh, we did the same uh, along some, um, uh, some, some uh, uh, reef, uh, artificial reef structures uh, in Brooklyn, and, and it, the site there wasn't as successful. So understanding what's working, what's not, how we can do better in the future, I think is key. I, I think it's also really important to be increasingly thinking and in more uh, dimensions um, and kind of in the way that New York City is a dense place with lots of people doing lots of things um, beginning to look at our different habitats and, and think about ways to densify because the kind of really bad old days of waterfront in the five boroughs of having piers that were just walked away from uh, I, I can tell you from the kind of commercial context today we don't have enough tie-up space. We don't have enough of the kind of working waterfront to support all of our ambitions around marine highway, around offshore wind. Uh, and so the kind of loss of infrastructure in order to create more habitat offsets is a really hard, hard pill to swallow uh, in this context of an, an increasing, increasingly kind of cleaned up shoreline. Uh, and so in that context, uh, kind of going to what Rob was talking about with reef balls and sort of subtitle habitat, if, if we are doing projects like the ones outside the window here or, or other, frankly, much more large scale uh, uh, coastal protection projects, there is going to need to be a balance of going out as well as cutting back where possible from, from the shoreline. But in a lot of cases, we don't have choices uh, on that because there's uh, a skyscraper next to the bulkhead and so what are our opportunities to be thinking in densification of subtitle habitat and achieving more habitat quality in the space that we do have and I think that pays to the alignment right like the earlier communication with the agencies and stakeholders put, put forward new ideas to get buy-in on those certain projects to kind of you know, break the barriers and, and try to come up with something new is critical yeah and I I was just going to say, I think there's some great examples of urban shorelines where they've been able to add habitat to the, the port structures and the bulkhead structures. There's Seattle, Baltimore. But they're a way to take these hard surfaces and soften them and, and bring life to them. Yeah, I was just going to add that um, I think as we move forward, it is complex, right? So layering all the information together to help us prioritize because when we do anything in the water, we also have to think about, are we impacting what's already there? You know, a lot of our areas are functioning just as they are today. Um, we may not realize it, but the sediment in the very bottom of the harbor, up the Hudson, and anywhere else, there's benthic organisms. There's, there's life there. Some people don't see it, because you might have to go to a microscope, but they're incredibly important to the food chain for our species that are critical, that, that we, we, we want to enhance. Um, and so we really need to think about what's there today, and 
what are we prioritizing for restoration? So I think we need to do a better job, and I think with today's technology, we'll be able to do this in the future, but layering all that information, where are the contaminants, where are the um, productive fish habitats, where are the opportunities for um, submerged aquatic vegetation restoration, where are the areas where we can't go um, back, but maybe we can find the priority locations that are gonna have minimal impact if we do fill. And we don't necessarily have all that integrated yet, but we have all that information in different locations. So as we move forward, I think we have to do a, as a team here and in the audience and all the other agencies, we'll probably have to do a better job taking all those layers of information to make it easy for us to prioritize and balance and figuring out what the answers are um, to, to balance the impact and, and benefits. Great, so, so in talking about you know, new projects, new ideas for mitigation and restoration, a lot of these projects uh, require long-term monitoring yeah. or can require long-term monitoring. And as stakeholders and owners, when you're staring down a new project, I think the last thing you wanna do is add on two, five years, whatever it might be of monitoring on your project. Um, and so those items potentially could be removed um, from a project to kind of avoid having to go down that road and invest that cost. Um, so to those projects and those, uh, those stakeholders, what thoughts or ideas do we have on that long-term monitoring um, based on our different positions? I can jump in real quick in that um, for New York State, we are gonna require some monitoring. It's usually limited in scope. We oftentimes do not have long-term plant replacement. There's usually some finite time frame which we require um, plant um, replanting. Um, but we're also trying to do some monitoring protocols to make it a little bit easier to make sure that we're monitoring in a way that's consistent over the years and with other state agencies. So we currently have a um, monitoring protocol with Department of State um, with New York State, but we also have a rapid. So I think over time, we probably have to come up with a really good monitoring protocol that we all as partners can say, okay, yeah, this is gonna get us some information so that when you have a new project, there's some potential estimate of financial investment um, so that it can be a factor in. Yeah, maybe that's, maybe that's wedge uh, 4.0. That's <laughs> Uh, I, I, yeah, I, I would just say, you know, one of the intrinsic challenges to, to what, what you're highlighting is that for the, the way that sort of the, the public finance system works is you've got capital dollars, uh, which come off of bonding and, and capital markets, and you have expense. And so when you have a project and you're, you're racing towards uh, trying to make sure the amount of money you have uh, fits what it's gonna cost for you to do things, and you have to do it on a specific schedule, you are only allowed to spend that, those capital dollars often on kind of hard construction costs or design and permitting that leads towards that. And that then you know, kind of creates a, a regulatory conflict or a stakeholder conflict um, due to that, that sort of system because uh, you have, uh, you know, as Heather just mentioned, a, a requirement to uh, demonstrate that what capital project you just did, if that was a restoration, is successful. But when you move into greater and greater distance from the backhoe being there, and be that three, four, five years down the line, you know, the, the, the kind of budgetary apparatus is beginning to take a view, that, that's more of an expense, a programmatic thing, not something that can be tied to that original capital budget. In the case of the mitigation bank, you know, we, we kind of created a very functional flywheel um, that uh, is, is creating habitat restoration and then selling those, those uh, environmental uplifts to capital projects that need that offset, which then is providing a system for that long-term stewardship which has been able to then feed into uh, this kind of five-year data collection effort uh, to, to what Terry was sort of mentioning. And, and to add on to that, I would say in terms of mitigation, uh, I think we need to look at how we incentivize and provide those credits. Um, I, outside of this region, I've heard of mitigation credits being allowed for public access. 
and for, for other amenities that are not currently usually provided here. So, and also looking at those credits from a holistic viewpoint, so that it's not just a wetland credit, but it's a wetland system credit. So there's one way to further incentivize the mitigation banking efforts. Um, but I also wanted to add on a different note that in New Jersey, they've tried to bring the state together to talk collectively in advance before these projects come online. So there's the New Jersey Interagency Council on Climate Change, which looks at all aspects of um, ecological restoration, adaptation, resilience. And then the, the partner to that is New Jersey, hopefully I get this right, New Jersey Coastal Resilience Collaborative, I think, NJCRC. And that's a group of uh, universities, nonprofits, and everybody in between, um, anyone that wants to be involved. And they've come together in, in really amazing ways to further advance, uh, you know, as all this funding comes out, how to come together as a state and regionally to try to make sure we're fully coordinated for those efforts. So is there, you know, given, given all these um, you know, strategies and, and long-term monitoring and, and site constraints and, and, and really, uh, honestly, different size scale projects, right? Small maintenance rehabilitation projects to large scale site redevelopment. Is there, you know, outside of the mitigation bank, um, the Sawmill Creek Mitigation Bank, is there a, a world in which a fund could be set up for owners or stakeholders to you know, fund or put money into that as part of a capital initial capital project for the long-term maintenance to be done by other agencies or other stakeholders or be used for future restoration projects? Is that... I'm, I'm trying to do that in the Meadowlands, but I'll let you know when it works out. <laughs> yeah, I mean, th so those are called um, uh, ILF, uh, which in, in lieu fee uh, programs. Uh, it is a system that exists across the U.S. It, it really, it hasn't really clicked downstate or North, North Jersey so much. There are actually some ILF operations upstate New York. You know, one, one thing about that is uh, the time frames need to be right and they need to be restoration projects available that those funds are sort of building towards. Um, our colleagues at the Parks Department um, in, in, in certain respects are sort of always uh, working towards uh, building pots to be able to jump into restorations on existing uh, public property. Uh, and there are real opportunities to sort of formalize that, that mechanism. But I, I do think sort of mitigation banks and ILF uh, in a way uh, relate to each other because the, the mitigation is already done and it's the backstop kind of, the gold in the bank. Uh, and uh, ILF is sort of um, hopefully the kind of gathering to be able to jump into a restoration project. But uh, we'll, we'll call out uh, Rebecca in the back of the room from the Parks Department, who you should grab uh, to <laughs> ask questions about that, and my colleague Sarah Murphy, who's in the back of the room, who's uh, really on top of the mitigation bank these days. Great, thank you. Um, so uh, let's see if I get my next question. We've got a couple more questions, and then we're going to open up for the group. Um, outside of kind of drone technology, uh, what, if any, other technologies are there that we've seen or looking at that could help with restoration and mitigation projects? Well, I mentioned the acoustic recording units, um, ARUs. They're small listening devices that can be placed out all over. We're using them to monitor Atlantic Coast leopard frogs, tricolored bats, uh, secretive marsh birds, and everything in between. And the beauty of it is you put it out for however, weeks at a time and then you can listen in on to what's going on out there when no one is disturbing the site. And so it, it really allows a, the, for collection of data that um, hasn't been possible in the past. Uh, but it is a lot of data, and one thing Heather and I were, were talking about is how much data we're going to continue to collect as our technologies get better and, and how we manage that. So that's, that's a, a huge part. So. There's probably um, different career paths that uh, are going to be available in this field of ecological restoration that's open to uh, 
data managers, statisticians, um, just you know anyone who has a, a mind for a good spreadsheet. <laughs> which that's a great segue into one of my last questions, which is uh, career opportunities. So, what career opportunities do we see in this field uh, to help progress some of these uh, challenges and solutions? And what uh, would some of their educational backgrounds be? I'll just finish up that answer. Um, by, and I'll let you guys jump in, sorry. Uh, but right now I'm hiring interns that can create story maps, that can keep our blog and our Instagram going, and that can take a lot of our data and make sense of it, and, and then bring that data out to the public so we're telling the full, full story. Well, I can jump in. Um, you know, <laughs> my role as a regulator can be a tough one. Right, we're often delivering news, news to people that they don't want to hear. It's a kind of a thankless job. <laughs> um, uh, it, but I'm here still after 20 years, and the reason why I'm here and why I have some colleagues that are here is that if we weren't here, what would it be like? And so I think if I could encourage that openness to young um, students and young adults and thinking about this career path, oftentimes that's kind of like a de facto um, role that people take. If they couldn't get a job somewhere else, they, they ended up saying regulations. Um, and so what we want to try and do is show people the value of our work, right? How are we kind of impacting the resilience of New York, the, res the resource that we all love? Um, so if we can start kind of flipping the script on that, that would be wonderful. Um, I am so lucky, though, to be able to be working on a, a resource that we're surrounded by that's really engaging and people really take it to heart. So we've been able to really hire people um, to do that work, but I just feel like sometimes it gets the short end of the stick and I'd love for people to flip the script on that. Maybe just to add in, and I, and I think we'd be remiss if we didn't point out that, you know, unfortunately those jobs often there's not enough funding for right. the regulators, you know, DEC <coughs> in particular, I know, and, and I'm sure it's true at other agencies that they've seen budget cuts over the years. and. You know, that leads, you know, obviously to, uh, uh, you know, a tough work environment, I guess, just on the individual basis, but also, you know, a challenge for the folks doing the work to be innovative or to go that extra mile and talking to people or to uh, collaborate as much as they would like to. I think that's something we hear time and time again from our, you know, uh, colleagues, and whether it's DEC or the federal regulators. Uh, is that they, you know, they would love to be able to be more innovative or maybe take a chance on a project, but um, you know, it's tough when they've got a stack of permits that they're trying to work through. So, you know, I think that's one recognition. You know, the other one, this kind of ties to that is, uh, I know in other parts of the country, uh, there's been some success, in particular around natural and nature-based resiliency features, and some of these more innovative practices that we know are are coming down the pike and are things that really we're gonna you know, need to, to be successful for all kinds of reasons uh, to uh, enable opportunities for uh, folks to come in as teams to look over those big projects um, and uh, be able to, to, again, you know, have the luxury of time and the ability to kind of think deeply about a project so that they can be confident uh, that they're not violating the trust, you know, the public trust in, in permitting the, the development and, and seeing a, a successful mitigation project go forward. If I can just e echo some of what Heather said, if you are interested in exciting renewable energy projects <laughs> in resiliency infrastructure, there is no better place to be in this region than working for the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, New York State Department of Environmental Conservation, National Ocean Marine Fisheries, and for us all to collectively be successful, we need a, a you know, a a cavalcade of talented young people knocking on the doors of those organizations and keeping the talent flowing into those organizations who are energized and and kind of in the in the weeds uh, very literally on how each and every single one of these projects is done so just really encourage you to uh, th these are big organizations and can be intimidating but a lot of them have uh, a kind of gateway programs and in the last couple of years of the pandemic have been super hard on on staffing and folks are looking for folks who who want to be in that space and kind of get on the on-ramp into those organizations yeah, I, I would add you know having a passion for the area you know and, and that can mean a lot of
lot of different things, whether it's like passion about being outdoors, passion about being around the water, um, passion about data sets, right? Like there's lots of different <laughs> versions of that passion that, that we need in this, in this field. Um, and creativity, um, both on you know, the consultant side, the city agency side, on the, agent, on the regulator and agency side as well. Um, and, and, a, and positive communicators that are willing to work on both sides because um, it really is a team effort, and I think that's you know, that's reflected here in the in the diversity we have on this panel. Um, but if anyone has questions about getting into this field, and, you know, I'll speak for everyone. You know, come find us, say hello, introduce yourselves. Happy to ask, uh, answer any questions. Um, so with that, I think we'll open it up uh, to the audience for mm -hmm. audience and questions. Uh, uh, gentlemen, uh, Bob Brady, uh, what do you understand? So, so uh, Hank, and Rob, if you can uh, paraphrase the question. Sure, and then sure. So uh, the gentleman asked uh, how successful we have been uh, as a community in, in restoring life to the, to the Hudson and the harbor, uh, in, in particular around commercial fisheries. And, you know, it's obviously a complicated question. Uh, I think in general, and, and something that our State of the Estuary report that will be out later this summer kind of gets into in detail. But uh, just to... Keep it simple, we've been super successful when we think about the, the estuary as a whole. We as a society have been super successful in restoring water quality. Uh, when you look at dissolved oxygen, obviously essential to uh, fish that breathe. Um, uh, it's gotten better, way better. Uh, when you look at public access, and you, know, you only have to look out this window to see all the wonderful parks uh, here and elsewhere in the region and up the Hudson, uh, to know that we've done a great job in terms of getting people out to the water and in helping people recognize what a great public space that is. Um, you know, we haven't seen, we haven't been as successful in terms of, of habit, in terms of sea life. And we've also done a very good job on both, you know, not destroying habitat uh, and, and also uh, in particular on trying to restore habitat. Um, we haven't seen the biology respond in the same way as the, in the way that maybe we might have. Uh, you know, I think for different fisheries, it's kind of a mixed bag um, in terms of thing, where things are happening. And um, I think we can point to a couple of different reasons why. Um, you know, part of it is offshore fishing um, and the pressure on fish stocks from there. Um, and also as well as climate change and changes in, 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 in additional stresses on fish populations. So. Um, so, in terms of commercial fishing coming back to the harbor, um, I'm going to turn to Heather to answer that. Uh, who's, who's more responsible for that than I am, or, or is, is responsible? But, but I would say, you know, I think it's it's that still. Far out. Yeah, I would in the future. I would say. But. If I if I could just add to to Rob's statement about um, the harbor. In terms, we've yeah. been doing a 40-year fisheries project, uh, fisheries survey uh, along the Hackensack River, and what we saw in 1980s was a very, um, it was mummy chugs. That's all we caught, we were hundreds of mummy chugs. Um, we're on our fourth iterative uh, <laughs> survey, and our, the diversity and the abundance of the fish is, has just multiplied. And we've been able to document that every 10 years. And it is a direct result of better land use practices, of the number of restoration and mitigation projects that we've undertaken. So, and, and I can report that uh, as of this year, we are seeing live oysters in the Hackensack River. We're seeing anemones and a lot more coastal sp species like croakers. So we have really seen a great re re rebound for those fisheries.
often on the science, um, citizen science work. So I think um, there's always a risk when we do citizen science work, but we can reduce that risk if we have um, protocols in place and a consistent partnership that we can rely on. Um, for example, the Hudson River Eel Project, that data is now being used for population assessment, and that's because that data was QA, QC, quality assured, uh, and reviewed, and we had very consistent, diligent, dedicated partners. So I think there is a way forward where we can use citizen science data collection to really inform our future. So that I, I know for sure. Um, I can say that I work for New York State, so AI, no, not yet, because <laughs> if you are no, <laughs> working for the state, you know, we're kind of a little bit uh, behind the times. What's great about working for the state, though, is that we are consistent and we're always gonna be moving in a direction. So I think as other people come up with innovations, we can help adapt them and move them forward. Um, and so that's what I'll be relying on our partners to kind of strategize on how to incorporate that in an efficient way. And citizen science groups are now being uh, taught how to use eDNA analysis yeah. to uh, look at uh, water quality and fisheries populations. And so that, that's kind of the next step and that, that's also a process where the risk can be minimized by fo following the proper standards and protocols. Oh, I'm sorry, environmental DNA analysis. It, it, you can capture uh, different fish populations, but we've been trying to use it and comparing it to our fishery survey, and the results are kind of interesting, but not conclusive. Um, so we have a ways to go with it, but it's a, it's a good first step. Thank you. Hey, so I'm with the Hunters Point Parks Conservancy, and in Hunters Point South Park, we've got some beautiful restored salt marshes, wetlands that look great, work really great, but we're also working on a project led by our councilwoman right now in Long Island City for restoration of a whole bunch of stuff, but including the shoreline. So I was at a visioning meeting yesterday, and you know, they asked me, what would you like to see in the shoreline? And I said, you know, I'd like to see more wetlands, salt marshes, but I don't know if that's the best thing along the East River where this is. Is there a group here that, like if you want to put in wetlands, can you like give recommendations? Is, you know, the berms and riprap better? And how do we go about to ask me? And I'm not the expert, I know what I like, but any ideas on what to recommend for this project that's going on in Long Island City? So, I'm happy to give some thoughts on it, which is just, you know, the, the harbor is, is an intense environment and so, uh, I think we need to always be careful about where we're proposing uh, different green infrastructure. You know, unfortunately, you know, 200 years ago, uh, it did look kind of more universally soft edge. We hadn't gone through and, and dredged uh, shipping channels. We did not have the level of vessel traffic that we have. So in some locations, riprap uh, or uh, a site may want to kind of become uh, mud flats. Um, I, I do think, you know, Hunter's Point South is a really great example of where through design and having a fair amount of space to work with, uh, you were, it was able to be achieved sort of a really beautiful mixed condition where tidal waters are able to come in. Uh, you're able to have sort of a protected area behind riprap where those plantings didn't get ripped out just in their first sort of couple months of existence. Um, but you know, every site uh, is unique, uh, and I think it's really important that we continue to have uh, strong and clear goals around softening our shorelines and creating more dense habitat environments. But also, we need to be really realistic and clear-eyed about what's appropriate for which locations. Sometimes when we get a little bit too aspirational on a given location, we'll find ourselves replanting something three times. Uh, and then really we just need to give in and admit to the facts of Mother Nature and uh, the harbor that we've created and this site wants to be this. And, and uh, I'm a big proponent of pilot projects, so start small and then build up because you could make a mistake with that first attempt. Um, and, and some projects, as, as Rob had shown the, the map with some holes where we've lost wetlands in the Meadowlands despite some really well-intended actions, you might have unintended consequences when you undertake something. So doing so on a small step is a lot better than doing so on a big step. And, yeah. and just to add, add to that, and, uh, 
you know, there's a real value in these projects that even if they're not, you know, a restored wetland, but provide some hint of what a wetland would be or, uh, you know, incorporate other ecological features in a densely populated place like Long Island City or I'm looking at Cary and Hudson River Park and all the great projects there. You know, there's a value there to be able to showcase for folks what, what the estuary could be as a, as a, or is in other places, but bring that kind of little, like, po part of nature close to home. Well, so, so I, I'll, I'll chime in on that. So I, I don't know if there is one perfect agency, but I think you're hinting at, or your question in my mind is, is about the process, yeah. right? Identifying the project, you know, identifying the right consultant team uh, of players to kind of help uh, envision that site, either through landscape architecture or the marine, marine structures, whatever that site might drive forward. And then that collaboration with the owners and the stakeholders a community will help kind of shape what is there. And then, like we were talking about earlier, the, the early alignment and coordination with the agencies. Take those ideas, bring them to the regulators, get their feedback, adjust the design, and then you know go through the steps and, and move it to the next. And I think if, if the vision is like, is wetland or, or um, you know, soft infrastructure at the site, you can push those bounds with the landscape architecture team to, to, you know, to kind of set up something new and, and then run that by the, the regulators to kind of get their buy-in. I, I think it's also just really important to recognize that change is real. Uh, that kind of starts with, with what Rob mentioned as to how much our harbor and harbor conditions have evolved. And when we're doing projects, we need to recognize that climate change is ongoing. You know, we will continue to have coastal storms uh, and, and we need to be open-minded about the fact that we live in a dynamic space and uh, that's the case for the habitat and that, you know, it really, it makes a huge difference at the start of a project, whether your, your elevation is six inches lower or six inches higher in terms of whether your plants are going to live. Uh, and then, you know, with sea level rise, whether or not you're at a point where that plant is set uh, and whether there's nearby types of plants that are going to be able to colonize that are happier at that the kind of changing elevations that are happening so it's a very kind of adaptive management system that needs to be recognized with any of these shoreline conditions great all right uh here and then uh, behind. uh so i guess what i've learned a lot uh, from you know, this conference so far, as well as from classes I'm taking from university and research I've done on my own, <clears throat> it seems to me one of the mo common themes or most, you know, biggest threats to wetland environments, as well as any ecosystem in general, is often urban development and human encroachment. Um, so I, I guess my question is, you know, I've seen a lot, uh, I live in South Jersey, and I've seen a lot of our ecosystems, especially forest ecosystems, you know, paved the way to implement, you know, urban development such as strip malls that are then left abandoned and take up that environment. Um, and I've seen uh, organizations such as my university, you know, uh, I guess fund opposition uh, towards repairing these environments. Uh, so I guess overall my question is, do you have any advice on how we as a community can help sway uh, opinion or get more involved, especially when we're not directly affiliated with an organization that is helping to repair these ecosystems. And I guess that especially applies to people from a younger generation, such as myself, that whose opinion may not hold as much weight in the society. I can jump in. <laughs> I think one of the things we've, we've been missing, we've, we've talked about this even as a group, is that um, we, have, we have a lot of monitoring that we've done, piloted some projects, Synthesizing that to come up with a concise success story is compelling, but also missing. So I think as we go forward, I think communication is key, right? And I think that's where our infusion of young talent is gonna be key, right? So how can, you, how can we uh, create that success story or, or interpret that so we can command more support for projects like that? I would say that in my role, I don't see that that's easily accessible at this moment, but I think it is a missing piece. And there's a lot of things out there, such as monitoring ports, that I think can be compelling 
they just have to be interpreted better uh, and, and put out there for public consumption. Thank you. Um, I have a couple things. One thing to just add to what Terry said about the fish coming back and the diversity increasing. In the Meadowlands, the birds have also had enormous increases in diversity. Birds that never were there before are there, eagles, ospreys, and so forth. So, I mean, it's an incredible place for birding to go to the Meadowlands. My other point is about uh, the marshes. Uh, the marshes around here, the whole mid-Atlantic, and, and probably New England as well, are not keeping up with sea level rise. The rate of sea level rise is faster than our marshes are able to acquire new sediment to elevate. So I think any restoration project has to bear in mind that perhaps in a decade, perhaps two decades, perhaps as time goes on, half a decade, they're gonna have to put new sediment on top to keep, it, keep the marsh going because the marshes here have not got space behind them to migrate inland. We've got development with roads, houses, towns, and <clears throat> that's gonna have to be the future of marshes is periodically adding new sediment on top. I would say it's not a question, but I agree. <laughs> um, but I, I, you know, one of the challenges is this idea of historic uh, contamination and, and how we can get all the agencies together to agree that, that it's urgently needed. Um, and, and you know, Judy was involved with bringing together a lot of uh, data that showed how different areas of the of New Jersey are keeping pace at, at different degrees with sea level rise, um, and right, not, not certain certain places are keeping pace with the current level, but the concern, at least in the Meadowlands, but the concern is given increasing rates that we won't, and the reason is is because most of our tributaries have been truncated, and we don't have that sediment source that that helps to naturally build up, so. I agree that we need to, I, I like to call it, re-nourish our wetlands, and, and the need is now. I think just adding a tiny bit to that is I, I think there is a real need and opportunity. We've, we have had fantastic uh, environmental regs that have helped clean up our harbor. And I think you know, now is the time where it's a, it's a delicate conversation, and it's not about attacking the good system that, that has established and, and returned uh, our waterways to a much more vibrant space. But what do we need to do to look at our, our present regs to make it, you know, make wise and informed decisions about adding that sediment on top of wetlands? That, you know, I think within the existing regime, you know, there might be views that that's adding fill to uh, the waterway. And so from that regulatory lens, how are you offsetting that? So you're actually doing a restoration oriented activity, but then needing to go find a mitigation source for that, which you know makes a very challenging situation. When it comes to our extremely large uh, resiliency projects, I think now is the time that, that we begin to kind of collectively have these discussions about what do we want to build upon on our, our, our regs for protecting our, our ecosystem and what do we need to do with the knowledge that we now have about how our environment's changing. And I would say in, in light of future uh, harbor deepening and dredging projects, there are a lot of people that are planning ahead and, and having these discussions about how to match up any, the reuse of any dredge material and how we get to use those for our habitat restoration and mitigation projects. So that's already being planned. Great, all right. I know there were a couple more questions. Uh, I'll stick around if, if they're for me. I'm happy to take a shot at answering them. Um, but we're at time, so I wanna thank everyone for sticking around and asking wonderful questions. And thanks to our panelists today uh, for presenting. Thanks so much.